Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very, very brief introduction. Um, I just on a personal level, very excited for tonight's lecture um, on a couple of different levels. First of all, as a relatively new rabbi of the shul, I'm still new enough to remember right after I, as I started looking into the shul, uh, both before I came on my official interview and immediately after uh, getting the position. So uh, any rabbi in a new position, you want to research the shul, where, where are you going? What's its history? What's been there before? On um, what shul, whose shoulders are you standing on? Uh, as you enter into a new community. And so uh, the little research that I did on the shul on the website and uh, just searching the shul, one of the figures that literally jumps off of the page in the history of this shul is Rabbi David Hartman, both as a founder of the shul and the legacy that he left uh, the entire community, which we will hear shortly much more about, not just here in the shul, but uh, the Kiva School and the Hartman Institute in Israel. It's, just, it's, a, it's a major legacy that, uh, that he has left. One that you, you literally, as I said, just jumps off the page as you begin looking into the history of this uh, particular community. So it's a really great honor and a, a special privilege to have Rabbi uh, Eric Grossman, who's now in his second year as the head of school of the Akiva School, um, who spent some time this summer in the Hartman Institute, as he will tell us all about, and will share some of the uh, philosophy and ideas behind uh, Rabbi Hartman and what drove him to become what he did. And without any further ado, we're very excited to have uh, tonight's lecture. Please, Rabbi Grossman. Uh, thank you so much, Rabbi, and uh, thank you all for coming and for this opportunity. <coughs> there is a parable that is famous in the Indian subcontinent about an elephant and a group of blind men. Uh, there's a group of blind men who have never before encountered an elephant. And they encounter the elephant for the first time, and they surround themselves around the elephant, and they try to figure out what this creature is that they are experiencing for the first time. And each feels around, and each tells the other what he feels. And one is describing the trunk, and one is describing the side, and one is describing the tail, and one is describing the foot. And each of them talks to each other, and they can't figure out what this creature is because each description is so vastly different than the other. The one who's describing the trunk and the one who's describing the tail, it sounds like you're talking about two completely different beings all together. And the various uh, forms of the story and some of the versions, the actual events that ensue are that the men start fighting with each other and arguing with each other and accusing each other of being liars because how is it possible that uh, they could all be talking about the same thing? Uh, this parable, I did not hear from uh, Rabbi Hartman. Uh, I don't even know if Rabbi Hartman was familiar with it. And yet, in my studies of Rabbi Hartman, I found that this parable was incredibly, incredibly informative and instructive, as I will explain in a few moments, uh, why this was so important to me. Before I do so, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Fornleth and the, uh, the Bailey Synagogue for hosting this lecture. I want to thank the Akiva School that actually has encouraged my study and uh, my attendance at the Hartman Institute this summer where I did research on this. And in particular at the Hartman Institute I want to thank, if any of you know him, Noam Zion, who was a great student of uh, Rabbi Hartman who sat with me for hours and hours and hours uh, unpacking and trying to describe Rabbi Hartman's philosophy to, uh, to me. Uh, so when I came to Montreal, I began my work at the Akiva School, and I became a member of the Bailey Synagogue, and I felt to a certain extent that I was one of these blind people feeling the elephant. Because if you feel your way around the Akiva School, and you feel your way around the Bailey Synagogue, it's really hard to try to deduce from feeling around both institutions who the rabbi would be that founded both institutions. They just feel completely different. And I felt like one of these uh, blind men really trying to figure this out. How could it be that the same man founded both of these institutions? They are so vastly, vastly different. And that was one of the things I tried to solve this summer in my, in my research. Uh, you should know, I imagine many people here are much more familiar with Rabbi Hartman than I am. However, I was a student of his in two different contexts. Uh, when I got to uh, Israel, I studied in yeshiva for, uh, for two years, 
and then I went to study at the Hebrew University. And when we had the choice to pick courses, there was a course that was available taught by Rabbi Hartman, and I immediately signed up and I became a student in his course. And then shortly after, I was so intrigued, I actually applied and became a student at uh, a fellow at the Hartman Institute, where I studied also for a, uh, for a year. I will tell you that the idea of an elephant is not the animal that comes to mind when I thought about Rabbi Hartman. Uh, it was actually more like a, uh, a bird, because I remember sitting in his classroom, and he would just fly in. Right? We would all be sitting there, and he would fly in, always late. Uh, to, uh, to class completely fush fits, <laughs> and he was just uh, just exuberant with everything. He just couldn't stop uh, talking and lecturing from the moment he walked in. His research assistant would follow, usually five minutes later, also completely fush fits, with papers flying all over the place. This poor man uh, had to copy. Clearly, Rabbi Hartman had told him on the way to the lecture what he had wanted to be photocopied and sent this poor guy to make the photocopies. Rabbi Hartman would start in Hebrew. He started lecturing in Hebrew. His Hebrew was notoriously bad. Uh, and actually, uh, some of the people at the Institute told me it was a tremendous tribute to him that even though his Hebrew was so poor, he was featured all the time in Israeli radio and Israeli television. Those times in Israel, there were actual laws that your Hebrew had to be at a certain level in order to be featured on the radio or television. That's how you think the language laws here are crazy. <laughs> the language laws in Israel were also crazy, and they had a formula that you had to be important enough, right, if your Hebrew wasn't good enough, right? So there was something not important, but excellent Hebrew could be on the radio, <laughs> but if your Hebrew was really bad, you had to be important enough to be worthwhile, and Rabbi Hartman fit into that. Uh, into that uh, into that category. Uh, after he would speak in Hebrew for a while, he would then transition into English. He just couldn't get over himself, and he had to speak in English. And then he, when he would get really, really animated, he went into Yiddish, at which point none of the students had any idea what he was talking about. But he didn't really care because he was just so excited about everything that he uh, was about to share with us. But the reason why I signed up for his course is because I really wanted to know what all the fuss was. I grew up in Toronto, and uh, my rabbi, Rabbi Stephen Saltzman, Zichron Olivracha, was also a fellow at the Institute, and he would come back all the time so excited about Rabbi Hartman's uh, ideas and what he had learned at the Institute, and I really wanted to know uh, what he was all about. I'd already heard about him in my teen years. That's why I signed up for his course. There's another reason, too, and that came from the years that I spent in yeshiva. I had no personal experience with Rav Soloveitchik. I was not a student of his. I never went to yeshiva university. I really had no direct contact. But all of my rabbeim, all of my rabbis in yeshiva, and all of the important rabbis that I had encountered were all students of Rabbi Soloveitchik. And I had a similar experience to the blind man and the elephant. All of the rabbis who not only were students of Rav Soloveitchik, but claimed that they were the legitimate heirs, they were actually preserving what Rav Soloveitchik was trying to say, all were so vastly different that I couldn't figure out who Rav Soloveitchik was. So my Rosh Hashiva, for instance, was Rabbi Gravender, and the Rabbi Chaim Gravender was a, uh, actually a professor of Bible before he became a Rosh Yeshiva. He actually wrote uh, entries on pre-biblical Hebrew for the Encyclopedia Judaica. Um, and at the same time, he lived his life as a complete Haredi. Actually, when you visited his house, he would have all of his svarim, all of his uh, religious books, and on the shelf behind them were all of his academic books, so none of his kids would have access to them. Um, in fact, he didn't even educate his kids in English, so his kids wouldn't have access. He raised his family completely, uh, completely uh, uh, Haredi. Actually, it was a funny story. Uh, when uh, we were students of his and we went to, uh, to visit him, he told us that uh, when he moved home, uh, the movers came and they asked him where his, uh, uh, where his television was so they could move his television. 
And he said, I don't own a television. You know, I'm quite afraid. He goes, I know, I, I know, no one here owns a television. Just tell us where the television <laughs> is and, uh, and we'll move it. He said, no, no, really, I don't own the television. He goes, yes, we know. You don't own the television. Don't worry, we have boxes. There are boxes from refrigerators. Don't we'll ever know. We'll move the refrigerator box. He goes, no, really, I don't own the television. And he had completely immersed himself in that community and wanted his children to have no contact. Is this what Rav Soloveitchik was? Somebody who, on the one hand, uh, knew about academia, but shielded his family and future generations. Or my other Rosh Hashiva was Rabbi Riskin, who was this liberal, modern, orthodox rabbi, a uh, forward thinker, still is, in terms of women's role in modern orthodoxy, a tremendous, uh, very much opposed to the Haredi community. Um, and he also claimed that he was carrying on the legacy of Rav Soloveitchik, that the most important thing was mitzvot bein adam lechavero, how you treat other people, ritual was less important. Is this, uh, is this the Rav? We were across the road from Gush Etzion with Rav Lichtenstein, who had a PhD in English literature, uh, and was also a Rosh Yeshiva, and prided himself on how he embraced both secular studies and, uh, and, uh, and Talmud at the same time. Is this Rav, Rav Soloveitchik? Uh, then I also had students of, uh, of Rav Schachter uh, from, uh, from YU, who was basically uh, Haredi in his, uh, in his views of halacha. And then I knew about Rabbi Hartman, who was this crazy radical thinker who wanted to revolutionize Jewish thought. So I was trying to put all of these people together, like the blind man and the elephant, and try to piece together who Rav Soloveitchik was from all of these different impressions. And I thought, Finding out about Rabbi Hartman would be an important piece of the elephant to figure out who, uh, who the Rav was. One of the things you'll notice about Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Hartman is that he was really a founder of institutions. And many of the students of Rav Soloveitchik were uh, great scholars or they were uh, founders of institutions. The Rav himself, and this is sort of what makes him a gadol, Right? Uh, was both a founder of institutions, the Maimondi School, Yeshiva University, and he was also a great scholar of texts. But when you look at his students, you see most of them fit into one category or the other. Rabbi Hartman was definitely in the category of the institution builder. That's why he built the shul, that's why he built the school, that's why he built the institute. Uh, he enjoyed Jewish texts, but in fact he wasn't such a scholar of Jewish texts and really didn't see himself as, uh, as such. He did have a canon of texts. He did have a certain set of texts that he kept returning to in all of his thought, and I've collected them for you uh, because I think in order to really understand them, you need to understand the text that informed his life and informed his thought. One of the things that's really interesting when you take a look through these texts is you'll probably be familiar with many, if not most, if not all of them. The texts are not so original. This is not how he staked out his claim. He wasn't such an original scholar. What's interesting is how he took these texts and used them in the building of his institutions, number one, and number two, how he was willing to actually say what the text meant. He was willing, when texts were radical, to say what this text is saying is actually really, really radical, and other people aren't willing to uh, take a look at it in all of its uh, in all of its sharpness. Uh, with that, let's take a look at, uh, at the first text that we have here on this sheet. And this is from Ketubot 16b. Uh, if you're not familiar with the text, you're probably familiar with the song. It's sung at just about every uh, Jewish wedding, right? Tana Rabbanan, Ketzad Merakdin Lifnei Hakala. It's a famous song that we sing at all weddings. It comes from the Gemara in Ketubot. Right? Uh, Chazal taught, how does one dance before the bride? In other words, what type of uh, words do you say when you're dancing before the bride? And there is a machlok, there is a difference of opinion between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. Beit Shammai says, one recites praise of the bride as she is. That means if you have a good-looking bride, you say, what a beautiful bride. And if you have a not good looking bride, you say, hmm, that bride's not particularly good looking. You actually uh, describe the bride as she is. This is what you should uh, do. Beit Hillel says, one recites, right, this is what the song, the song actually chooses Beit Hillel. Amazingly, that lyric didn't make it. Kalanaya, the Chasuda. But you actually always say, 
that the bride is beautiful and attractive and fair. And Beit Shammai said to Beit Hillel, in a case when the bride was lame or blind, in other words, not particularly good-looking bride, does one say with regard to her a fair and attractive bride? The Torah states, keep yourself from a false matter. Beit Shammai says, how could you possibly say what a beautiful bride? The Torah tells us to always be truthful. And if you say to an ugly bride that she is beautiful, you're lying, and the Torah tells us to be truthful. And uh, Beit Hillel uh, comes back and says, no, no, how can, you, how can you say that? We know there's a halacha, there's a law, that if somebody goes to the market <coughs> and, buys, uh, and buys a particular gift, and you look at that particular gift, even if you're thinking to yourself, what a halushious thing that this person just bought, there's a halacha that you say, what a nice purchase you made. Right? That's a law. You always compliment somebody on the purchase that they've made, Right? You should never make somebody feel bad that they've purchased something that you think is not particularly nice. And uh, Beit Hillel says, and you wouldn't say the same thing about somebody who marries someone, right? And they shouldn't they be afforded the same type of compliment? You say to somebody, right, yes, your choice was a good choice, even if this isn't what I would have, have chosen. Now, why was this text so important to Rabbi, uh, to Rabbi Hartman. There are two values inherent in this text. The opinion of Beit Shammai is the value of truth. You should always do what is true. And the value of Beit Hillel is the value of shalom, of peace. You should always do something that makes people feel good and feel at ease. And the question is, which value does this text support? And the answer is? Shalom. Rabbi Hartman said the answer is both. The text supports both. Even though in the end, the halacha is like Beit Hillel, Rabbi Hartman points to this text, text number three on page two, from Eruvin. <coughs> Rabbi Abba Amar Shmuel, Shalosh, Shanim, Nichlaku, Beit Shammai, and Beit Hillel. Rabbi Abba said, the Shmuel said, for three years Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel disagreed. These said the halacha is in accordance with our opinion, and these said the halacha is in accordance with our opinion. So three years Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai are arguing with each other, uh, each arguing about the halacha. A divine voice emerged and proclaimed, Elu ve'elu divrei Elohim chayim. Both these and those are the words of the living God. Uh, Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai are arguing with each other, and God intercedes and says, you're both right. And Rabbi Hartman said, the importance of this text about the bride is that both emet, both truth and peace, are both valid. It is true. In a case where we have to decide one value over the other, Yes, it is true, we value peace over truth. But that's not because we're a religion of peace. Right? If we were in a religion of peace, then Rabbi Hartman said we would be nihilists. Right? Nothing would matter. We would just say whatever made people feel good, and we wouldn't believe in anything. However, if we were a religion of truth, a religion of emet, we would be fundamentalists. Right? And so we are always in tension between these values of truth and peace, and we live our lives in tension. And that, I discovered this summer, is the key to understanding Rabbi Hartman, that he believed in the idea that we should always be in tension between two separate values. That is where Judaism lies. And therefore, it is no coincidence that he founded both a school and a shul to be very different institutions because he believed that they should be in tension with each other, because each represents a different value that conflicts and is in tension, what we call in philosophy the dialectic. And there's no coincidence, as a student of Rabbi Soloveitchik, Rabbi Soloveitchik loved the idea of dialectic, this idea that you are always arguing back and forth between two different, uh, different positions. Uh, so what are the school and the shul? What do they represent in the mind of Rabbi Hartman? I uh, would argue that the shul represents the idea of unity and conformity. 
That's what a shul is supposed to be. I was actually surprised in my research that uh, even though Rabbi Hartman was such an open thinker and believed in such innovation, when it came to the Sidur, he believed that the text of the Sidur was sacred and should not be modified. Why is this interesting? Uh, as a very liberal thinker, at the time he was writing, in liberal Judaism there is this idea that the Sidur should be modernized and should reflect new values. Uh, and that was going on in all sorts of different, uh, different places. Even within orthodoxy, if you take a look at some of the Sidurim that were, uh, that were produced, uh, there were innovations that were introduced into the Sidur. And I would have assumed that Rabbi Hartman would have been on the side of innovation, and yet he wasn't. He believed that the Sidur was sacred and we should not modify it. I was stunned. Uh, and this is what he wrote. He said, prayer is the medium through which Chazal educate the community. That is why Chazal were so insistent on the matbeah shel tefillah. That's why the rabbis were so insistent that the Sidur have one fixed form. It's not about authoritarianism, Rabbi Hartman wrote, but about having a unified theology for the whole community. The Sidur, he said, is the way that we make sure that all Jews have the same set of thoughts and beliefs. Con complete, complete conformity. And when you think about the synagogue, a shul is really about conformity. Shuls can only have one misora. We're sitting here where the Svaradi Minyan meets, right? And why in this building do we have a Svaradi Minyan and an Ashkenazi Minyan? Because we believe you actually have to preserve your own misora. There's no way to have two different misorot in the same synagogue. Synagogues are unified. And if you want an easy proof, go to a synagogue. The worst, what's the worst honor? My father was a gabai for, uh, for nine years. Uh, what is the worst honor that you can give to a guest of the synagogue? Right? It's the one that everyone thinks is the easiest. Pticha, right? They open the ark, right? As you have somebody new, you don't know. Do they know Hebrew? Do they not know Hebrew? Will we embarrass them? Let them open the ark. It's a nice thing. The worst thing you can possibly do, because every synagogue knows this is exactly how we open there. No, we open it now. We open it this way. We start on the left. We start on the right. No, we only open the curtains. We leave the doors closed. No, now we open the doors. We close the curtains. The word, and everyone does it in their way, and that's how shuls are supposed to work. Uh, a custom that is really not well honored in many shuls today, unfortunately. You're not even supposed to change the tunes in a synagogue. This is halacha, right? When you go into a synagogue, a shul has its own tunes. They're halachas. You're not supposed to change the tunes. Uh, and uh, the purpose of a shul is to maintain a certain type of, of, uh, of tradition. Schools are just the opposite. Certainly the school that Rabbi Hartman founded. If the shul represents unity and conformity, the school represents creativity and diversity and individualism. Uh, the school that he founded, the, uh, the Akiva school, he wanted students to each learn with his or her own curriculum. He hated the idea that everyone would have the same way. Every person should learn in his or her own uh, way. So schools celebrate the idea of diversity and creativity. And when he founded the Akiva school, he says, I want a school where Orthodox, conservative, reform, non-affiliate Jews of every different type can come together. That's not what his vision was for the shul. The shul was supposed to be about conformity. It was the school that we could have diversity and have different views, and we could be open to all sorts of different ideas. And these two institutions were in tension with each other, and I think he loved that idea that you had these two different ideals. When I got to the Akiva school, I was trying to figure out what uh, what were the principles that Rabbi Hartman founded the school on? I read up the literature and I read up what he wrote, and it took me a while, uh, but eventually I came up with three words. And I realized that the Akiva school was founded on three principles by Rabbi Hartman individualism, creativity, and pluralism. Those were the three things, individualism, creativity, and pluralism. And when I went to the Institute, I met with uh, Noam Tzion, who you clearly uh, know, and I said to him, I, I figured this out, right? I read through his works, and I figured out these principles. And he said, uh, yes, but no. Really, what you miss out is that those three are in tension with three other ideas. 
Noam Tzion said to me. Uh, individualism, yes, but individualism is in tension with community. On the one hand, the school celebrates the individual. On the other hand, you have the tension that you're part of a school community. Those are meant to be in tension. Yes, the school represents creativity, but it is also an orthodox school which represents tradition. So it's creativity that's in tension with uh, tradition. And pluralism, yes, he wanted a pluralistic school, but make no mistake about it, Rabbi Hartman believed in truth. And he believed that there was a truth to be told. So yes, pluralism and different ideas, but there was a truth out there. And when you think about it, how beautifully these ideas align, individualism, creativity, and pluralism are very much the school, community, tradition, and truth are very much the shul. That's what the shul is about, community, tradition, and truth. So you see these two things in tension. Now, where did he get these ideas from? Uh, the whole idea of individualism, he got from a text, which I did not uh, re uh, reproduce here, the beautiful text that he loved, which is a text from the Mishnah in Sanhedrin, that uh, if you think about God as a king who mints coins, all uh, royal regimes minted coins, yeah, um, like when the Canadian government or the US government has the uh, mint and we mint coins, you make a mold, and every coin turns out exactly the same, right? You look at a loony, you look at a toony, every loony and toony should look exactly the same. And the Mishnah says, but the magic, the miracle of God is that when God mints his coins, right? Each one is different. When God creates different human beings, each human being, what a miracle, right? He puts us in the press, right? Human, 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 and each turns out different, what a magical mint God has. And that was one of the texts that Rabbi Hartman uh, treasured as, uh, as the source of individualism. He also believed that after the destruction of the temple, the big change in Judaism was one of conformity to individualism. And when you think about it, in the time of the temple, the, uh, who were the clergy were priests. And priests were supposed to be people who were all the same. There is no individualism of priests. That's, by the way, why priests all had vestments, right? Priests all had, uh, had special clothing that they could wear. Why do priests wear vestments? So that they all look the same, so that they lose their individualism. That's also why we do this also to judges, right? Judges wear robes and England wigs, right? So they all look exactly the same. Right? They're supposed to lose their individualism into the collectivity of what they represent, either uh, Jewish law or Canadian law or British law. Um, Chazal, right, had this idea of individualism. It was Torah study, Rabbi Harpin said, that created individuals because you can't put an individual in front of a text and two people come out with the same message. So it was the transference from, uh, from the priesthood to the rabbis that transferred us from a communal religion to a religion of individuals. And it's actually an interesting point that uh, Jewish clergy, we are the only non-vested clergy. In every other religion, their clergy wears vestments. Judaism is the only religion that has a non-vested uh, vested clergy, and it very much goes to this idea that all rabbis are supposed to be individuals. And of course, all rabbis, I learned this from Rabbi Fink at, uh, uh, at my yeshiva, right? The job of the rabbi uh, is to differ with every other rabbi, right? That's what you get paid for, <laughs> is to have a different opinion than every other, uh, every other uh, rabbi. Uh, it's, uh, uh, so that's where he got individualism from. Where did he get creativity from? Creativity he got, I believe, from Rabbi Soloveitchik. Uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik, was from this brisker tradition of Talmud study and really had this idea that being creative was a value in Torah learning. Uh, this is much more radical than you would think. Torah learning in general is about the idea of passing on the Mesorah, right? The best thing you can do is to perfectly replicate what came before you. And Rabbi Soloveitchik said, no, the greatest part of the Torah study is your creativity, what you can add to Torah study. This is really what made Yeshiva University so radical, it made the Rav so radical, and this uh, Rabbi Hartman got from, uh, got from the Rav. Uh, I had no idea where Rabbi Hartman got his pluralism from until I met Noam Tzion. 
uh, who pointed me to a very important uh, uh, piece of furniture that he kept in his office, which was a basketball. Uh, Noam Tzion keeps a basketball in his office because he said it is from the basketball that Rabbi Hartman learned pluralism. Huh. <laughs> Pretty fascinating little conversation piece, what happened. So apparently when he was growing up in New York, uh, he came from a very Haredi family, and he was taught that Jews are special, Jews are the owners of truth, uh, Jewish people are the only people who know what is good and what is right. And then he went and he played basketball. And of course, when you play basketball, uh, it doesn't matter what race you're from or what religion you're from, uh, Rabbi Hartman was famously an excellent, excellent basketball player. And he realized all of these other people were great basketball players. And he realized something else too. They were also very nice people and very smart people and very interesting people. Exactly the opposite of what he had been taught growing up. And he believed it was on the basketball court that he realized pluralism. The idea that we are not the owners of truth and goodness in Judaism. Truth and goodness belong to all sorts of different people from all sorts of different races and cultures and backgrounds, right? We have something special, we have the Mesora, right? But there is something that all peoples, regardless of the race and religion, have to add. That's where he learned the idea of, uh, of pluralism. And it's an interesting thing too, and uh, you see at the end of the, uh, of the source, uh, why do we follow Hillel? over Shammai, right? We follow Hillel over Shammai because, right, Hillel was pleasant and nice. That's why we end up, not, not because he was more true, not because he was more right, but because of the type of person that he was. And Rabbi Hartman took that very much to heart. Uh, and you'll see at the Akiva school that he found that still till today, the idea of goodness and kindness is the value that permeates everything. And we keep on his tradition here that when you judge which direction you should go, it should always be the direction that is directed by kindness. Um, the uh, school versus the, uh, the shul leads into what I think is the most interesting of the tensions in Rabbi Hartman's uh, thought and writing, and that is the idea of study versus practice. Uh, so please take a look at source number four, another favorite of his. It's on page two at the bottom. Rabbi Tarfun is Keni, the Subin Baliat Beit Nitzah Belod. Rabbi Tarfun and the elders were reclining in the loft of the house of Nitzah in Lod. When this question was asked of them, Talmud Gadol or Maase Gadol? What is greater, study or action? Study or practice? Rabbi Tarfun Omer, Maase Gadol. Rabbi Tarfun said, action is greater. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Talmud Gadol. Rabbi Akiva said, study is greater than action. Nenu uh, Kulam, everyone answered and said, study is greater. As study leads to action. So the, uh, the rabbis sort of split the difference and said if you had to decide between study and uh, study and action, you would eventually go to, uh, to study, but not because it's an independent value, but because it leads to action. So again, you see this idea of tension. What is more important, study or, uh, study or practice? Uh, why is this tension uh, so, so important in, in his thought? When you take a look at the history of Jewish, uh, of, uh, of Jewish ideas, you find something interesting. In the Torah, what is the value, study or action? Only action. You never see anywhere in the Torah the idea of a scholar. It doesn't appear anywhere in the Torah text. The idea of Moshe as Rabbeinu, the idea of Moses, as a scholar, right, is a complete invention of Chazal. Right? This is how the rabbis envision Moshe. But in no place in the Torah do you ever see Moses as a scholar. He is totally a man of action. He is known for his actions, for what he does. You never see him actually studying, nor do you see Joshua studying or any of the prophets studying. It is the idea of action that dominates in the Bible. 
Now contrast that with Maimonides, and those of you who read my lecture this time last year about Rambam know that Rabbi Hartman felt that Maimonides was the starting place for any type of Jewish thought. No one was more important to Rabbi Hartman than Maimonides. And what did Maimonides feel? Everything goes to thought. Everything goes to study. Practice is really something that we need to do because we're human beings. But if we could be ideal, like God, we wouldn't be involved in practice at all. We would totally be involved in thought and thinking. Exactly the opposite of the, uh, of the Torah, exactly the opposite of the, uh, of the Bible. Uh, so the two are truly different approaches to what Judaism is, uh, is, all, is all about. And Rabbi Hartman felt that tension between study and, uh, and action. Uh, now, uh, what is more important according to, uh, according to this? It is, uh, it is study. But the source actually ends with something uh, quite, uh, quite interesting. Take a look at the bottom of the source. Tanya is taught in the Brayta. Rabbi Yossi says, Torah study is greater as it preceded the mitzvah of Chala by 40 years. In other words, when the Jews were in the desert, they learned the mitzvah of chala, the mitzvah of separating out a piece of dough and giving it to the, uh, uh, to the priests. I mean, so we still continue until today, whenever we, we make bread or make chala. Uh, and the Brayta points out that that mitzvah didn't take effect for 40 years later when the Jews actually got to the land of Israel. So clearly you can have study that is independent from practice. And Rabbi Hartman turned this whole idea on its head and said, maybe it works in the opposite way. I think one of his deeper ideas, I heard this when I was a student in the Institute uh, in my teens. Um, he said, maybe we can even reverse that. That after the destruction of the temple, when Jews could no longer practice a huge number of Jewish laws, and most of the laws of Vayikra, there's so many uh, parts of Judaism are completely tied to the temple. What did the rabbis do? They recreated practice in study. That the rabbis started to write books about the temple, about the temple service. They wrote the Mishnah that described how the temple service worked. And Rabbi Hartman said, that the rabbis were trying to actually recreate practice in study. And the way, think about this on Yom Kippur, right? What do we do during the Avodah service, right? We study a section of how the Avodah was conducted in the temple as a replacement for the practice that we can no longer do. So study and practice have this interesting tension with each other. This, I think, is a very, very original idea of his. I haven't heard it from anyone, uh, from anyone else. Uh, but he also had some, uh, something else to say, which also turns it on his head. And that is, he said, in the modern world, I'm going to differ from this Mishnah. And in the modern world, I think that study needs to be informed by practice. That when we study, it needs to be informed by practice. And what did he mean? When he went to form the curriculum of the Akiva school, he said, I don't want to start from study. I want to study start from practice. So we're in a different age, we're in a different world. I want to turn this whole idea on its head. And the very first text that I want to study at the Akiva school, found on page three, source number five, this was the very, very first text ever studied at the Akiva school. If you see your fellow's ox or sheep gone astray, do not ignore it. You must take it back to your fellow. If your fellow does not live near you or does not know who he is, you shall bring it home and it shall remain with you until your fellow claims it, and then you shall give it back to him. You shall do the same with his ass, you shall do the same with his garment, and so too shall you do with anything that your fellow loses, and you find you must not remain indifferent. It's a law from Parashat Kitet Tzeh, from the book of Deuteronomy, the law of returning lost objects. He said, well, why is this a text? 
that I'm choosing to be the first text to study because it comes from practice, because my mother, Rabbi Harkin said, was always complaining that I lost everything. I could never find my socks, I could never find my shoes, I could never find my jacket. And he said, and my guess is that most of my students at the Akiva school are just like me, and they're always losing things. And I can attest, 50 years later, nothing has changed. <laughs> just this morning, I had the mother approach me, and go, I can't believe I just brought my son his new winter coat, and already it's gone, I have no idea where it is. So Baruch Shekibanki, on the very day that I'm talking about this, just this morning, and Rabbi Hartman said, it's the practice, it's what is practically going on in people's lives, that should inform what text we study. And he took this text and he said, in my school, I don't want any textbooks. He said, I'm going to take this text, right, I'm going to put it in front of the students, and I'm going to let the students discuss this, and I'm going to let the students create their own Gemara around this text. This is one of the places that he got into trouble, because people said, how can you have a school where you have like seven, eight, nine-year-olds who are making up Gemara? And he said, I absolutely believe this. I don't want any textbook. I want the students to look at their own experience. I want them to see a Torah text. And I want them to build this on their own. I want them to have that type of uh, creativity, that type of, of energy. Uh, he also believed that this made Judaism into a living tradition, something that was always changing, also egalitarian. Every age, every gender could take, uh, could take part in this. This is what he saw. Now contrast this to his view of the Sidur, right? The Sidur, he's saying, is something that you can't change at all, and yet the, in the school, right, I'm throwing out the idea of even having a textbook, everything is creative clearly had the idea of these two being in tension, the idea of conformity at, at the synagogue versus the idea of creativity at the, uh, at the school. Uh, he also had this idea of tension between the past and the present. All of you know that after being in Montreal for a number of years, he made Aliyah. And uh, I believe one of the reasons that he made Aliyah was Rabbi Hartman believed that the past and the present always had to be in tension with each other. Uh, Israel represented the present. You, it represented what Judaism is and what, what Judaism will become. And the Galut, the diaspora, he believed represented the past. And he believed they should always be in tension with each other. He took great exception, he argued, against a Ben-Gurion. Ben-Gurion uh, when he uh, founded the state of Israel, believed we should throw out the galut, we should throw out the past, right? It's all about the present, and Rabbi Hartman very much uh, pushed back against that and said you can absolutely not have the present without having the past. It's interesting, I got into uh, an argument with a, uh, with a friend of mine uh, at Biba, so I mentioned that I daven here for uh, not just uh, during the year, but also Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And one of the reasons I love davening upstairs at Bailey on, uh, on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur uh, is because uh, there's a there's a real choir that uh, that sings and there's a chazan sings. And I said I really love that. It's not uh, quite how I grew up. I grew up in a sort of much more formal synagogue like uh, the Shar here. Uh, but I said I just I love the idea of a cantor and a choir. And that's what feels good. And this guy, who's an Israeli, was yelling at me, as Israelis are wont to do, right? And saying, what a terrible this idea is, who wants a choir, who wants a cantor. That's all part of the galut. That's all part of the diaspora, right? In Israel, right, we come to shul in sandals, right, and without suits, right? And everyone sings together. There's no cantor, there's no choir. This is what the present is all about. Uh, no, I, I disagree, and Rabbi Hartman disagreed. The uh, diaspora and Israel are always in tension. Now notice, whenever there's a tension, Rabbi Hartman always comes out on one side. That's what makes him interesting. In the end, he decided he wanted to be part of the present and not part of the past, but that's not because he rejected the past. He believed they should be both in tension, but if I have to make a choice for, uh, for myself, I choose to be part of the uh, of the of the future of the future. Uh, another uh, tension that he uh, that he had is the idea between the written Torah and the oral Torah, the Torah Shebichtav and the Torah Shebalpeh. Uh, the uh, synagogue, of course, represents the Torah Shebichtav, 
that which is stable, that which is solid. And the school represents the Torah Sheba Alped, the oral Torah, which is always dynamic and, uh, and, always, and always changing. And he believed these two were in tension with each other. But there's another text that he enjoyed very much. It's a wonderful quip uh, that, that is recorded in, in Chazal. Uh, that the rabbi says, right, how silly it is that people have the custom to stand up for a safer Torah. Now, we all know there's a custom, right? Uh, anytime there's a safer Torah, right? That's why we have the bells on this, so we, so we know. Uh, if ever the Torah is up, we know that everybody stands up. Right? And uh, we have the statement that says, what a silly idea that you would stand up for a Torah and not stand up for a rabbi. Okay? And actually, the, the language is, is, uh, is very strong. What a stupid thing people do that they only stand up for Torahs and not stand up for rabbis. This apparently was a very popular saying among the rabbis. Uh, but how can you say such a thing, right? Of course you stand up for the Torah. The Torah represents God. Well, but why should you stand up for, for a rabbi? Uh, and Rabbi Hartman said, because where is the future of the Jewish people, right? Where is the, uh, the future, the creativity, the, uh, the energy? It's all in the rabbis because they're the ones who are in conversation, who are creating, who are being, uh, 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 pushing Judaism forward, right? The Torah represents the uh, the past, the adultified. So he definitely comes out on one side, but he believes that the two should be in tension with each, uh, with each other. Uh, which brings us to one more dichotomy, and that is the prophet versus the rabbi. And I want to take you to what I think are the most important texts to, uh, to Rabbi Hartman. We take a look at page, uh, page three. We're on uh, source number six. Amar Ameymar, Ameymar said, a sage is greater than a prophet, just like I said, uh, said before. A sage, a rabbi, is greater than a prophet, as it is stated, and a prophet has the heart of wisdom. Who is compared to whom? You have to say that the lesser is compared to the, uh, the greater. So uh, when the verse says that, uh, uh, that a prophet has a heart of wisdom, it's saying that the prophet is being compared to somebody who is wise, and of course, you always compare something lesser to something greater. There's nothing more important than wisdom than being a uh, rabbi. That's the side that he uh, that he came out on. And uh, on page four, take, take a look. I have to I have to uh, apologize. Uh, this is a text I never ever teach. I had made a, a vow to myself many many years ago never never to teach this text. I find this. Uh, this is uh, perhaps the most overtaught text in all of in all of Judaism. Uh, I only break with my principle because of my heart and valued this text uh, this text so much. Baba Metzia 59b. Everyone, uh, uh, everyone, uh, I think has heard this text in one form or the other. This is uh, when the rabbis are arguing about a certain type of oven, whether it is uh, tamay or tahor, whether it's kosher or not. Uh, and Rabbi Eliezer is arguing with the chachamim whether it is uh, a kosher oven or not kosher oven, and, the, uh, and, they're, uh, and they're in an argument, the Chachamim say it's not kosher, Rabbi Eliezer says it is, and Rabbi Eliezer brings every type of proof for his position. He says, if I'm right, take a look at that tree, and there's this tree outside, and this tree like uproots itself and flies through the air and replants itself, uh, and the rabbis say, we don't care about trees, you know, that, that's, that's not an argument. And uh, Rabbi Eliezer says, look at that river outside. And this river starts flowing backwards. And he says, see, you know, uh, the river is proving that, uh, that, I, that I'm right. And the rabbis say that, you know, that's not, that's not proof. And finally, after uh, other arguments, Rabbi Eliezer says, I'm sure that I'm right. If I'm right, right, let God himself prove it. And a voice comes out of heaven and says, of course, Rabbi Eliezer is right. And the rabbis respond to God and say, Right? Lo b'shamayim he. The Torah is not in heaven. We don't listen to you. We don't. Uh, we reject what you say. Uh, what you say, God. And this is a favorite, famous uh, uh, text. Uh, so this text uh, can be interpreted in, in hundreds of different ways. Uh, why was this important to Rabbi Hartman? Because it showed the rejection of prophecy. Right? It said that to us, prophecy is not important. What God says. 
uh, is not important. What is important is what we as humans create in Judaism. That's the side that we, uh, that we come out on. And in terms of the shul and the school, the shul represents prophecy and the school represents the rabbi. The school represents the idea of the chachamim. Because what is a synagogue? A synagogue is all about prophecy. It is about one right idea. That's what prophecy is about. It's about preaching. It's in one direction, right? That's also, by the way, if I can have a little plug on behalf of the rabbi here, that's why you don't talk in shul. Shuls are not places of conversation. There's only supposed to be... <laughs> shuls are supposed to be places, right? Of, communi of communication, and uh, Rabbi Hartman, who got this idea from Rav Soloveitchik, said, uh, traditionally prophecy is God speaking to us, but since God no longer speaks to us, right, through prayer, we speak to God, right? But it's meant to be a, uh, to be a conduit, like a pipe, up and down, right, between us and God. That is, prof uh, that is prophecy, that is the synagogue. But the school, the Beit Midrash is all about conversation. It is multi-directional. It is always about, uh, about dialectic. The goal isn't to communicate, right? The goal is to understand. People are supposed to understand each other. And also prophecy, right, is about one truth, whereas the school and uh, the rabbis, that's about coming up with compromises, agreements, trying to make things work together. It's not about one, uh, one idea. Rabbi Hartman believed that Judaism, in its essence, was anti-prophetic. That Judaism rejected the idea of prophecy in favor of dialectic, which again, in the end, is why I believe he chose the school over the shul. And you can tell, because when he went to Israel, he did not found a shul. He founded a school. He founded the Hartman Institute. In the end, he made the decision, right, that although I value both, and again, that's the depth of him. It's not that I reject one. Both are important, and we need both institutions. But me, myself, Rabbi Hartman, if I have to come out on one side, I come out on the side of the school, right, because that's where the dialectic, uh, where the dialectic happens. Um, and uh, if you take a look at the source on the bottom of page, uh, page five, Rabbi Hartman pointed to this as the reason for his ultimate decision. Rabbi Huda and Rabbi Jeremiah, citing Rabbi Chia Bar Abba, said, it is written, your fathers have forsaken me and have not kept my Torah. If only they had kept studying my Torah. Indeed, if they forsook even me, all would turn out well, provided they kept studying my Torah. God says, I wish that the Jews would have rejected me and kept studying Torah. Better to reject me, God, and keep studying Torah, because eventually, if you study Torah, you will come back to me, God. But just coming to me, that will not lead you necessarily back to Torah. And Rabbi Hartman believed and he wrote about this, that coming to Israel, he saw a people that had abandoned God uh, by and large. The Israel that Rabbi Hartman arrived in in the early 70s was a very, very secular state, and he was a deeply religious person and wanted to move the state of Israel into a more religious place. But he believed the way to do so was always through study, because study will eventually lead people Towards, uh, towards God and towards a greater embrace of, uh, of Judaism, but things did not work necessarily in, uh, in reverse. And that's why he came out in favor of the school in the end. But having said so, he appreciated the dialectic. He appreciated both, uh, both institutions. Um, and in the end, when I reflected on all of these different students of Rabbi Soloveitchik, I realized that I think Rabbi Hartman is the one who got it right. Because even though all of those other rabbis that I mentioned in the beginning all took one part of Rabbi Soloveitchik, either the scholarly part, Rabbi Soloveitchik had a, uh, had a PhD in philosophy, or they took the Talmud part, or they took the Zionist part, or the modern, all of the people I mentioned, it was only Rabbi Hartman who took the message of dialectic 
from Rabbi Soloveitchik. The message he took from the Rav is that you always should be in tension. And how did he prove it? Because if you read through the books, who does he argue with the most? Rav Soloveitchik. And he was not afraid to argue with the Rav because he said, that's the message that I got that you're always supposed to be arguing, you're always supposed to be in tension, because it's through the argument, it's through the tension, right, that we have creativity, that Judaism thrives, right? And uh, in that, I would say, he ended up perhaps as the Rav's most faithful uh, student. Thank you so much. So, um, I'll, I'll take uh, uh, two or three questions, and then uh, I want to leave you with one final thought about the uh, the elephant. Yeah, please. I'm going to that you're using the word conformity to the shul. Mm -hmm. Growing up here, I didn't live in this neighborhood, so I don't know what the services were like during the week. But I remember coming here on Sikhat Torah, because this was the shul that was non-conformist, in the mainstream Orthodox community. This was a happening place on Simcha Torah. Hundreds of people used to come here. We would dance on yeah. the street. Women would be carrying Sifre Torah. It was like, you, ne you never saw it anywhere else in Montreal. It was like really coming out from what other mainstream Orthodox synagogues. So I'm just wondering why you use the word conformity. Sure. Um, because the synagogue as an institution right, represents conformity. That's why I talked about the Sidur. But you're exactly correct, and he writes about this, that the complexity of Hartman's views was even within these two institutions, there was an internal dialectic. Right? So within the school, for instance, he writes, that even though the school represents creativity, the school also believes in conformity in that we are anchored to certain texts and certain traditions. So within the creative, there is also the traditional. And again, he founded not a pluralistic school, but a pluralistic orthodox school. And he said the same thing about the shul. So while the synagogue represents conformity, as you see through the Sidor, you're absolutely correct. Within that conformity, we also have the creativity. So he said, and he writes about this, um, when people would, uh, would come to him who had uh, issues with tefillah, with prayer, he would say the Sidur rep itself represents that past and that conformity, but you yourself, what you bring here, represents the creativity. Okay? Um, and, uh, and certainly he was radical. Uh, there's a really incredible statement that he, uh, that he made. Uh, he said there was a, a, a time at, at, at a synagogue that he was, that he was at uh, where they couldn't make a minion. There were not ten men in the in the room, but there were ten people. There were a couple women uh, women there. There would have been ten people altogether. Um, and he said, "Let's make a minion." Uh -huh. And people said, what, "What do you mean? There aren't ten men?" He goes, "No, let's count the women." And and uh, and people said, "Based on based on, on what text?" He said, "Based on no text. Based on the fact that I say so." And he said, well, "Why do you say so?" He goes, "Because it's right." Because it's silly not to count women, you should not count women in the minion. Okay, this, I'm, I'm, I'm just quoting. I'm just quoting here, I'm not making any statements here. Um, but his point was, yes, even within the, within the synagogue, he definitely felt that. Um, so uh, I think the two institutions, the way he writes about them, represent those two different things. But yes, within them, yes, uh, his, for a pluralistic school, it was very traditional. And for a traditional synagogue, it was very, it was very creative. And he believed in that internal dialectic within the institutions. Uh, you spoke before about how we're bound by the Masora, by, by Minhagen, by tradition, and then you spoke about the tension, the dialectic between the past and the present. How can there be a successful dialectic when we're bound by, between the past and the present, when we're bound by the past? Um, Does it not tie our hands? Uh, yes, well, it ties us. Uh, it definitely ties our hands, and he believed that that was a good. That was a good thing, uh, that we needed to be rooted in uh, in something, that we needed to be tied uh, tied to something for sure, um, and that's actually where the where the creativity came uh, came from. Uh, he didn't believe in complete op uh, complete op uh, openness. No, we should absolutely be tied to the uh, to the past. And yes, it, it might restrain us some, but uh, but that's part of that that tension. 
Yeah, that's basically. What was his attitude towards uh, the scholarly study of uh, Tanakh? Well, that's so interesting that uh, it's not a question I expected uh, ex uh, expected to come up. Uh, so I can speak from my experience at the Institute. It's interesting. <laughs> he founded the Hartman Institute as specifically an Orthodox institution. And he founded his high school that's attached to it as a specifically Orthodox institution. Um, and yet, this summer, I was the only Orthodox rabbi who was at the Institute. The Institute, uh, this summer, had 200 conservative and, uh, and reform rabbis who were there. And the scholars that he picked uh, there are often scholars who uh, are completely into very, very uh, radical forms of Bible, uh, Bible scholarship, um, things that are well outside of the pale of accepted uh, orthodoxy today. And yet he wanted these people at his institute, uh, both to learn and, uh, and to teach. So I would say, even though I don't know of his specific writings, I don't know of anything that he's written on this topic, he certainly invited these ideas into his institute. And I would say he was comfortable with the conversation. Yeah, and that's, uh, that, I think, is a fair, uh, a fair, a fair description. Uh, so to conclude, I just want to say that uh, I think that the blind man and the elephant <coughs> is really the best way to understand uh, Rabbi, Rabbi Hartman's whole view of, uh, of, of Judaism. Because he really believed this idea that every one of those blind men were all of us. That was his vision of pluralism. That every single Jew and every single person who studies is like one of those blind men right, who is able to contribute their particular perspective on, uh, on the truth. And each of us has something to contribute, and that's where his pluralism comes from. But at the same time, he believed in the elephant. He really believed that there was a truth. And his pluralism wasn't a pluralism, as I said, of nihilism, that everyone is right. And he spoke against that, right? Everyone has their own view to contribute, but there really is a truth. There really is an elephant there. But no one person knows the truth. And that was his view against fundamentalism. None of those people feeling the elephant uh, can claim that they know the truth, they have something can, to contribute, but there's no human being who knows the truth. And therefore, there's always a place for a different view. And that's why there's always a place for both the school and the shul. Thank you so much.